Welcome, everyone. I'm Kathleen Cooper. I'm the Director of Communications for the Office of the Washington State Auditor. I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here today, uh, especially with such short notice. We really appreciate your dedication, and we look forward to uh, answering your questions. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to introduce, you've heard Adam speaking, my colleague Adam Wilson. Uh, he and another colleague of mine, Laura Cameron, are the hosts of this meeting. We wanted to make sure that we were as available to you to make sure that tech issues were not a problem as possible. But Adam's going to go over a few housekeeping rules about how we intend to go through the, the uh, media availability today. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to Adam. Thank you, Kathleen. This is just a uh... We're gonna just the rules of the road so that we can get through this. Uh, and uh, it's our first Zoom press conference, so bear with us. Uh, live on TVW, uh, Pat's gonna make some opening remarks. After that, I'm gonna call on the folks who have already indicated they have questions one at a time. I'm gonna say who's going first. The AP will go first. Uh, then I'll unmute you and you get to ask your question. I'll mute you. Um, it looks like we have maybe 12 folks that want to ask questions. So if you have an immediate follow-up, try to message me in the chat and I'll try and let you go. If I miss it or if I don't catch it, we'll just go through the order and then see who else has uh, questions at the end. All right, we're going for about an hour to about four o'clock. You can message me, you can message Laura Cameron with questions. We're gonna rely on the chat. Here we go, over to you, Kathleen. Okay, thank you. So uh, we are here today to uh, address your questions related to the third party service providers security incident. Uh, and I want to start by introducing Washington State Auditor, Pat McCarthy, who uh, will have some remarks and then we'll take your questions. Great, thank you, Kathleen. And thank you all for being here. I too appreciate that you've taken the time on short notice to attend this um, media uh, event. Um, so today I want to talk to you about a cybersecurity incident, as Kathleen alluded to, involving a third party service provider used by our office. Although we will keep this high level, I want to emphasize that we are being careful with our words and the information we share. We want to protect individuals and protect government systems whose data may have been exposed. Most significantly to the public, this incident involves a large amount of ESD data on individuals. And I know Washington's, Washingtonians are frustrated and this will add to their frustration. Each individual who has been impacted by the earlier fraud at ESD is already frustrated. Everyone who has been a victim of cyber attack is frustrated with how often personal information can be attacked or stolen. I'm sorry to add to that frustration and worry. We are absolutely committed to doing everything we can to mitigate the harm caused by this incident. Let me give you a brief overview. We use a third party service provider, Acelian, to transmit data files in our audits. In mid January, Acelian announced it had a security incident in December. Upon investigation, we learned the incident allowed unauthorized access to audit records stored temporarily in a Cellian system during the file transfer process. The records include personal information as a part of approximately 1.6 million unemployment claims filed in 2020. Again, that's the number of claims. Our understanding is that the number of individuals affected is less than 1.6 million, but more than a million. Additionally, the incident may have affected personal information of a smaller number of people, including data held by the Department of Children, Youth and Families. And it included non-personal financial and other data from local governments and state agencies. I want to be clear that we are providing estimates on our figures. We are reviewing files and the incident. I also want to be clear that the Employment Security Department did nothing to cause this. This was an attack on a third party service provider. This incident had multiple victims. We at the State Auditor's Office are one of them. Based on news reports, we know other significant public sector organizations were affected by this incident. 
I'm aware that a Cellian spokesperson said that this involved a 20 year old legacy product and that we moved to their new system, Kiteworks, after the breach. SAO and others across the globe rely on Excellion. We have used Excellion software for 13 years and it has been kept up to date throughout that time. And we had almost completed the process of moving um, to their new system, Kiteworks, before we learned of this incident that involved SAO. The move to the new Kiteworks system was completed on December 31st. We paid for, we expected, and we deserved to have a secure system. We believed that Acelian was providing a secure file transfer product for the state of Washington. This incident is being investigated by law enforcement. Since we learned that our files may have been affected, we have been reaching out directly to the state agencies and local governments that provided this data so that they can take the steps they need to. We have been in contact with WATEC, the governor's office, the attorney general's office, and law enforcement. We are working as fast as we can to assist individual citizens whose information may have been affected. We have created a web, a, web, a web page to offer the information we can share. You can find it by going to our site, www.sao.wa.gov. The security incident page is prominently linked to our homepage. I should note that this is not an issue folks should contact ESD over. It did, an, it did not involve their systems. Finally, I want to emphasize that we take the pain and frustration this causes seriously. We wanna make it right as best as we can. We are committed to staying in communication with everyone who, who may with you and the public. This is an evolving situation. I know you will have questions and we will answer as best as we can. Transparency and accountability are our bedrock values. Still, I have to ask everyone, including the public, to bear with us. This is a challenging situation, one that calls on us to move as fast as we can, but also to be accurate, to be circumspect, and to be cautious as we work to prevent any further harm. I'll now take your questions. Or I should see Kathleen and I will. Okay, uh, let's go. I'm, where'd you go? One moment while I find the Associated Press, I believe we have Jean Johnson. Do, do we have Jean? Jean. I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna message Jean. <laughs> okay. Oh, so as you all know, with the pandemic, we are communicating on <laughs> multiple devices. Adam, I just received an email from Jean that said that he uh, is trying again. So I think we could, right. we could move to the next person on the list and we'll come back to Jean. All right, stand by, stand by. We're going to go to Jim Bruner. Jim Bruner, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I guess I'm wondering, A, you referenced this old older software product by Excelion. Did you have any reason to believe, you know, Excelion has said they've been encouraging people to move to their new product, which you did. But did you have some warnings in any sense that this might not be as secure a product? And related, was there a need for the auditor's office to obtain and transmit such personal data to conduct your audit, such as, I take it, full social security numbers, driver's license information, and bank information? Yes. Well, you know, first of all, let me say, absolutely not. We had no indication, no inclination, that we, this product was not um, secure. Um, as for um, transferring information, I mean, that's what we do. 
Uh, we do financial work, we do cybersecurity work, um, we do federal audits, we do state audits, uh, we, we audit every governmental entity in Washington state. We have 2,300 um, government types in Washington state, local and state agencies. Um, and that's what we do. We, we transfer large file transfers from a receiver to a sender and back and forth. That's how we do the book of business in the state auditor's office. And that's the way we've been doing business for many, many years. Oh, Adam, you're muted. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, Jean, are you ready? I'm gonna try and unmute you. Okay. All right. Let's go to the let's go to the next person, please. All right, we're gonna go with Laurel from the spokesman review. Stand by Laurel. Hello, could you hear me? Yes. Um, and I, so I just wanna, um, I guess, clarify and just double check, um, quick question. The data from ESD was the data that you were collecting for the audit on their previous fraud situation, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, so the, and then I guess just quickly following up on that, the other data, that wasn't ESC, um, do you, can you talk a little bit more about what exactly was included in that? Well, we're doing all that due diligence and we're working with local governments that were impacted and state agencies that were impacted to, to ascertain all of the information that was transferred back and forth. Some of it could be de minimis, you know, we're meeting on this date at this time and then we're transferring information files back and forth. Some of it's more significant, some of it um, is, personal information um, that can include a wide range of things in the, in the work that we do in the state auditor's office. And that's what we're getting our um, head around, knowing all of the things that could have been in those files. If that answered your question, I don't know. And then Kathleen, if you think of, I'm, I'm not hitting the mark on their <laughs> answers or if or you, any of you reporters think I'm not answering your question, let me know because do the best we can. Right, absolutely. All right, we're moving on to Sarah Gensler uh, with McClatchy. Here we go. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, mine's just sort of a clarifying question about some information that's on the website and in the press release. So um, in this morning's press release, it says that the auditor's office first learned of the incident on January 12th and immediately took action to determine what files might have been accessed. Um, and then in the statement on the office's website, it says it wasn't until the week of January 25th that Excellion confirmed to the office that uh, your files were subject to this attack and provided information that you guys needed to identify what files were impacted. So can you sort of clarify that timeline, sort of when you initially found out and how this has proceeded so far? So the, the information that Excellion put out to us on the 12th was just a pro forma letter saying that they had a cyber or a security incident um, at Acillion. At that time, um, uh, we did not know that SAO uh, was part of the clients of Acillion's at that time that actually had a hack or been compromised. Um, on the 13th, they let us know that we were part of the 50 so clients that they have that uh, experienced this um, or a were a part of this incident, uh, the security incident. We didn't learn until the next week um, from a Cillian that it also included these files that were from the ESD. And every step of the way that, that we had any inclination that, that we could be in harm's way, we contacted WATEC, which is the Washington uh, cyber folks. Um, we contacted 
the attorney general's office. We contacted risk management. We, we did all the steps that we needed to do in order to get our head around what happened. We also proceeded to contact, uh, once we got through knowing exactly who, who were the people, who were the entities that had this happen to, we began the process of reaching out um, to them to let them know what was transpired to the best of our knowledge with the information we were provided by a yeah. source. Yes, and, and Pat, I, I would add to, to continue the, the timeline that you laid out there, um, that it was only last week that we understood the nature of the data that was made vulnerable from the ESD. We, it, that was, and as you can imagine, as we've spoken with you all about it today, that was a very high order of magnitude and that requires a, a much higher response. And so that is as soon as we learned that that was what was affected, we, we had to, to completely scale up our response uh, and, and work with you know, even more specialists uh, and specialized uh, you know, legal advisors and all of that kind of stuff. And so, so uh, we understand that when people hear that the security incident that we knew about it on January 12th, understandable to think that there ought to be some sort of notification very quickly, but it actually takes time to ascertain what had happened. And then there's um, notifying that number of people is very complex and requires a lot of assistance from our insurance company and things like that. So. This, I, let me just add, this is an ongoing investigation. Yes. All right. We're going to go to now to Tom Bonzi. There we go. Uh, sorry about that. Is a quick question and then a more substantive question. Is there any info on what foreign country, if there was a foreign country involved as the source of this hack? We have no knowledge of that. Okay. No. And then is there anything affected people should do right now if, if they're, for example, in the roughly 1.4 million unemployment claimants? Um. There are some guidelines that are a part of our web page. Maybe Kathleen, you could talk about what we what we were able to at least put out right. for, for citizens to look at what they can initially do while Absolutely. we're trying to provide some more assistance as we get mm -hmm. that place. Get, get that going. Exactly. Happy to do that. So so our we we stood up a dedicated web page that will be continually updated right now at sao.wa.gov slash breach twenty twenty one. It contains uh, it, it, it's, a, it's an in-depth notice, but in that notice, it contains some of the initial steps that people can take when they, when they suspect that this may have happened to their personal data. I wish it weren't true that so many of us had, have had this experience uh, before. And so that, that's, that uh, notification lays out a lot of those steps uh, in very clear language and gives links to credit reporting agencies and things like that. And as we gain more information about how specifically uh, those affected individuals will be notified about this specific event, that webpage will be updated with that information as well. All right. Let's uh, go on to Nicole Jennings. Hi there, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. My question is, what is the scope of the damage here so far? I know it's an ongoing investigation, but I mean, what is the kind of thing that could have happened with this information? Is this the sort of thing where people's identities would be stolen or uh, purchases would be made in their name? Or I mean, what, what are kind of the dangers of what, what we could see happening here? And then and how, how widespread is this? Which government agencies and which local government departments um, were affected by this? Well, let me say this. I don't have a, uh, a clear answer on what, what could have, what could be the, who are the, who are the bad guys? What could they do? Um, what they could do to a citizen? Um, we all can read stories about what happens, but um, that's what, why we have law enforcement working on this and special uh, attorney general 
specializing on cyber attacks um, to be able to give us the information that we can give citizens to know what they can do to protect themselves. Um, uh, you know, we're not alone. I hate to say this, it, it doesn't make anyone feel any better, but we're not alone in having a, a breach or, you know, an attack of any nature. Uh, we have not heard yet from anybody affected by it, but that doesn't mean that it ha hasn't happened. I just want to make it clear we have we don't know that anything has happened so far. Now, I'm, I think I'm missing on one other question you had. No, I think one of the other questions that, uh, Nicole, that you asked is, is sort of the the shape of the whole uh, breach that affected SAO. And the answer is that, that that investigation is ongoing. We don't, we don't yet know the uh, a full accounting of what has happened with this breach with the Cellion. That is part of what we're doing right now and working with uh, all of the uh, partners that Pat has mentioned and the company to continue to, to figure that out. Um, our purpose today was uh, again, when we learned about this type of information that would affect so many Washingtonians, our purpose today was to, uh, to make that public as quickly as we could with, within reason uh, to empower Washingtonians to, to, um, to take the steps that they need to take. But, but this is gonna be an ongoing uh, discussion and we were, we're gonna work very hard to be tra as transparent as we can be while, while balancing that with security. We have individually um, contacted every um, um, local government that we believe is a part of this um, group of uh, files. Uh, we have uh, contacted um, every one of the um, state agencies who uh, would be impacted um, as, as, a, as it relates to the files that we were given from a Cillian. Uh, so the governments know um, it, who they are. If, if you're a local government and you have not been contacted by our office, then you, you weren't a part of this breach. If you were a state agency and you have not been contacted by our office um, to date, um, you have not been a part of this breach. But we're working on the information we've been given by a Cillian. All right, I am going to go next to Drew Mickelson, or it looks like we've got uh, King Fine. We're gonna, you know, hang on a second. Apologies, everyone. That's okay, that's all right. Thank all of you for your patience. We, yeah, yeah. we have long admired the governor's staff. They're very good at this. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a new medium for us. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to jump down to, uh, I'm going to unmute King TV and uh, hopefully uh, I've got the right folks here. No? All right, move on to Lindsay Sheldon. All right, uh, I have a couple sort of uh, yes, no number questions and then a longer question. Um, my first question was um, if you could clarify, um, I've heard the 1.6 million people and then you know, was 1.6 claims, more than 1 million. Then I, I've seen 1.4 million. <laughs> Do you have sort of a, a good estimate number that we can go with? Uh, do you know the contract amount with Excellion? And just to clarify, are you going to be notifying people individually? Like, are people going to get an email that says, hey, your specific, your information has been exposed? Those are my first three quick, quick hits. Yeah. Pat, Pat, would, you like, would you like me to take that? Those, sure. are, those. <laughs> those are those detailed questions that, uh, that, that my team is responsible for. So those are great questions, Lindsay. So uh, here is our current understanding. Uh, the, the number of, uh, it was 1.6 million claims that were made vulnerable by this breach. That can represent fewer than that number because some people can file multiple claims depending on the type of unemployment insurance that they were asking for. But our understanding is that the number of people that would be affected by that 
would be well over a million. And I apologize that I don't have a more exact number for you on that, but it's something that uh, I, I'm working to determine as well. So I've made a note of your interest in that. Um, uh, I, I don't believe that either Pat or I know about the answer to the question about the uh, Acelion fees. And so I've made a note of that as well. And then you had a third part and I almost had it. <laughs> Could you repeat it, please? <laughs> um, are you going to be sending, you know, emails or some sort of direct notification? Yes. Um, information made the biggest. Perfect question. Yes, no, exactly. And, and so we at the state auditor's office, no, we will not be doing that, but, but there will be a, a company that is doing that on our behalf. Uh, that is part of our work with our special attorney general. Who, uh, the, it's a, it's a, uh, an attorney that specializes in this kind of thing uh, and, and helps, helps governments respond to these sorts of things. And so there will be a uh, a call center that ultimately will be stood up so people can call and ask questions about this. Uh, I believe there will also probably, if, if I were to guess, this is, I should be clear, you know, I would imagine that there would probably be some sort of written notification as well. But that's one of the reasons that we stood the website up uh, as we did as just a very first starting place for people to go look for that information. But we are aware that not everyone has internet access. And so there, there will be steps that we will take to make sure that there's equity in the way we inform everybody who may have been affected. Thank you. And then my longer question was just in relation to um, all that, you know, personal information that, that may have been exposed. I understand that was um, in relation to your investigation into the fraud at ESD. Wondering if you can explain sort of why I have all that information of, you know, a million plus people. Um, I think some of us were under the impression that ESD knew, you know, more about where the fraud was. Were you doing sort of a deep dive looking at a lot of different accounts? Did this was fraud that hadn't been detected. I know you can't say everything, but if you kind of give us an idea. I can, I, can, sure. I, yeah. I think I can try and answer right. that. So, so we're doing a number of audits. We increased the number of audits that we were doing of ESD. Um, and based on some of the situations that have happened in other states with regards to um, uh, fraud that happened similar to what happened to the ESD uh, in Washington state, um, in, a, in our review to do a performance audit, which is gonna show a, a different window of what really happened um, with, with this fraud that happened in Washington state, we needed to have all of that information in order to look to see um, what, uh, what problems could have been in play. Um, and I, I can't get into the specifics of it, but it, it, it was doing the work of of auditing the issue that happened with the fraud. I mean, it is ironic um, <laughs> that this would happen, uh, but that is that is really the, the situation. Does that answer? I think so. All right, I'm gonna now go to Vanessa, Vanessa from King. Hello. Um, and just based off the question you just answered, I have a really quick question off the top. So if it wasn't for the fraud that happened, to e uh, happened at ESD, we wouldn't be in this situation? Well, we wouldn't have probably had that tranche of files that we needed to review, but we do review information from the ESD on a normal basis. We do federal audits. We audit every governmental entity in Washington state. Um, anyone that gets public dollars, we audit. And it will have, sometimes it's more voluminous than others. Um, and, um, you know, if you're King County or DSHS or ESD, you may have more that we're going to review. Um, but this was unique in that it was the entire year we needed to see in order to do an audit of what really transpired. And, and so in, the, in that, it was unique to that degree, but we do, it, we do transfer files. I mean, that is the book of business of the state auditor's office. That's why we and require I, on a secure. That's why we require a secure file secure. transfer product. I was just going to add, Pat. I think that's a really good point. I was just going to add that we wouldn't be in the situation if the if if there had not been an incident at our third party service provider. That's really the answer. And uh, and now my my two questions. One, I, I know that the information from the Department of, of 
children, youth and families um, has been compromised. Is is there any information that had gotten out that might put any children in danger and what is being done to maybe protect them? And also, I know that you have just said you've been using Excelion for 13 years. Um, when they said that they were going to switch to a new system, did you take Excelion at their word that it would be secure or did you uh, investigate the new system and, and review it yourself before you signed on to it and agreed to it? Well, uh, the, the mere fact that the state auditor's office had used um, a cellian for the last 13 years without incident um, meant that we, and it's a subscription service that we have with them. Um, and every year we review it and every year we, you know, we attest, they attest that, you know, we're good to go. Um, so we had no inclination um, that it was less than as we moved to their new product. Um, and we had moved a number of our um, uh, divisions into the new product. We just hadn't completed that process. Uh, but I can assure you, if there was any indication at my level that Acilium wasn't providing secure file transfer service, then we would have done something about it. But that is not the case here. Mm -hmm. And I think to your first question uh, related to DCYF, obviously they are in the best position to answer questions about the specific steps that they're taking, but I can say at a high level that, that nobody takes that more seriously than they do, and, and they have had the information that they needed to, to be able to, to do what they needed to do uh, related to that information. I, I, I think we are all... Um, chagrined uh, by, by these facts and, and have done our best to give each of the affected uh, entities the information that they need so that they could then take the steps that were appropriate for their, uh, their role. Thank you. All right, now we're going to uh, attempt to do right by Jean Johnson here. <laughs> Maybe the third time's the charm. I'm afraid not. Um, it appears that phone numbers do not behave in the <laughs> to unmute mode. Oh, goodness. We are very we sorry. Apologize. We apologize. Okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, Keith Eldridge, I'm going to find you in the list. Can you? You good, Keith? I see you as unmuted. I think you need to uh, unmute Keith. This is Dan as photographer. No, I'm, I apologize. I have two Keiths in the, the queue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we go. Um, the right key. Is it possible that the, uh, many of the people have already been protected from the last fraud incident with ESD? They already have fraud protection on their systems, and so they're, they're, they're safe this time around. Is that a possibility? And, and really, how widespread, uh, Pat, is this possible? Would, could people have bank accounts uh, empty because of this? Well, that, of course, is the fear of all of us, right? Um, we're all concerned that anything of that magnitude would happen to any citizen in Washington state. Absolutely. Um, as to the first part of the question, I do not know the answer to that. And we can... Um, see if we can ascertain that information mm -hmm. that as a result of the very first experience that, that people may have put things in place to um, protect themselves given the circumstances initially. Uh, but I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Yeah, I've made a and note. Will state, and will the state um, reimburse anybody who may experience financial uh, loss because of this? Again, that's what that's what we're, why we're working with uh, the AG's office, um, the Attorney General's office. I shouldn't use acronyms. The Attorney General's office. Uh, why we were working with uh, risk management for the state of Washington, and why we are working uh, with our insurance company for the state of Washington. Um, so, I don't know what what, what people will be compensated for, but we're we're working on and finding that information out. And you haven't had any reports of anybody reporting fraud yet? Not at this time. Thank you. All right. 
I am uh, assuming we don't hear from AP right now. I am going to try Q13 news. Hmm? Okay, sounds like I'm going to go to Q13. Here we go, hang on. Can you all hear me? Yes, a kind of, it's a little bit choppy. Okay, um, I'll do my best here. Uh, first, we have a question from uh, a viewer, somebody who's commenting on our, on just kind of our post about this, wanting to know if the Washington State Legislature is going to provide free identity protection software. Um, now that state agencies were hacked and has lots of private information, I, Pat, you kind of alluded to this um, about the frustration and many people obviously filing for unemployment uh, likely don't have the funds to afford uh, adequate or what they may deem as adequate uh, security protection software. Um, is this something that the attorney general uh, or, or the state auditor's office or even the state itself can provide to the people impacted by this? I don't know the answer to that, but we, I will tell you this, that at 7.30 this morning, we had a very good meeting uh, informing the four corners, uh, Republicans and Democrats leadership uh, of the House and the Senate um, uh, and their staff uh, to inform them of, of this situation. Um, and the state legislatures want to do what they, what they, what they do is to try and assist people uh, Washingtonians to have good laws that protect them. So I don't, we didn't have that conversation, but that very well could be a conversation we have, have in, the, in the near future um, about what the state could do or what, could, what the state could provide. And in the meantime, for anybody who is concerned about their private information and or bank accounts, uh, I know that you've advised others to, to go to your website. Are they in the meantime to wait and see if the state would provide this kind of um, software protection or this kind of service to monitor their credit reporting or what should they do? And what should we tell our viewers tonight or in 20 minutes because I'm on at four o'clock? Well, I, I, would, I would tell your viewers they need to do what they to protect themselves if they can. Um, and in the meantime, um, we'll have a further conversation about what we could do in a more global fashion uh, uh, from the state of Washington, but in the in the short term, um, if you are concerned and you have the ability to put in place things that could protect your um, financial or private information, um, it, it would be advisable, in my opinion, to do that if you could, um, and not necessarily wait until the state of Washington could provide that service. Um, I, I I don't know if I, I'm sure every Citizen Washington State has at one point or another. If you had a Target card, you got um, you. They were uh, had a cyber attack several years ago, and and I know I was one of them. And so, you know, we have to do what we need to do. So, anyways, um, but it's a it's a good question, and I I'm sure as legislatures like to do, um, they will probably take it under consideration. And, and last question. Oh, I'm sorry, Kathleen. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I just wanted to reiterate. I I know. I really do recommend that uh, all of you, on behalf of your viewers as well, take take a look at that webpage, sao.wa.gov slash breach 2021. It has some of those initial steps that Pat was alluding to, things that people can do um, while uh, while while they're they're still we're still assessing who exactly needs to be notified and get more specific information. But there really is some good stuff in there. We'll absolutely put that website up and, and direct Thank you. To go there and we'll include a link on our webpage as well um, to be even more helpful. Uh, last question, and, and I don't mean this in an accusatory way, but more of kind of a um, clarification on security processes and, and that sort of thing. Over the last year or so, there have been a number of incidents with ESD, and I know you've mentioned that this is not um, at the fault of ESD, right? This is a third-party provider, but um, you know we've had uh, situations with that new system that opened up to provide um, more paid family leave. And then there was a big lag in, um, in getting those claims out. And then in June of 2020, there was that fraud uh, with like a billion dollar loss, um, that check fraud related to COVID um, and related to unemployment benefits. And then we've got a data breach. Is this kind of a, 
for ESD, this is kind of a wake up call and saying, hey, you know what, we may need to overhaul our security system to better protect the American people and the public who are confiding in us with their personal information. Because yeah, this could be incredibly uh, frustrating to a lot of people and say, gosh, I don't, I don't even know if it's worth filing an unemployment claim at this point, because I may be exposed and have all these other things to deal with. I mean, you know, you just gotta think about how that person is feeling when they're already kind of down about the pandemic, job loss, everything. <laughs> This is one of the things I would say. One of the things we do is we audit government and we and, and we help them understand how you can avoid fraud um, and an, a negative impact in your systems. And we've had some big fraud cases in Washington state last year. Um, the Pierce County Housing Authority is a, a perfect case uh, in point. Um, so we know that um, uh, people can do fraudulent activity internal people and external characters. And that's why we do the work that we do is to help provide information uh, to local governments and state agencies on ways they can protect themselves and their clients and their customers. Um, and that's the purpose of auditing is to really help, especially with regards to financial, but we also do cybersecurity audits to help them know uh, what those um, red flags would be or what those um, things that they need to improve to improve the security of the information they have. And uh, the Employment Security Department is no different than any other state agency or those that have personal information. And in government, uh, whether you're at the local level or through the state level, we have your personal information. I mean, and, and we are all committed in Washington state, those of us, um, who have are privy to that information um, are committed to protecting it, um, and we we're vigilant, really, quite frankly, um, and that's why this is such a it, it's a it's it, it's a distressing part because it happened to a third party vendor um, that we we believe was a trusted um, source for us to be able to transfer that information. Yeah, and I think to add on to that, I I think. Uh, it's completely understandable that the public's confidence may have been shaken. I, I just, I think Pat and I both, and everybody that you would talk to about this, um, but, but I would really want to be clear that the ESD didn't have anything to do with this. Uh, this was, this was a, an incident that happened at a third party vendor uh, at the auditor's office. And, and so I just, I just want to make sure that that's understood as, as much as possible. Um, there are public servants across the state of Washington who are working very hard, uh, and this particular incident didn't have anything to do with the ESD. Thank you both very much. Sure. All right, we are now going to Sue Romero. Okay, who's next? All right. Next would be, stand by, Andrew McIntosh. Okay. You're getting bumped up, Andrew. Here it comes. Good afternoon, auditor. Um, Madam auditor, I should say. I have a, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, Excellion said in a statement to me this afternoon that they notified their customers of this breach on December 23rd. You've talked about January 12th and you gave another date about when you learned how bad it was. When exactly did, did they tell you something on, on December 23rd? And did they, you know that, that they, it they did not? They did not. They did not tell you at all. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, second of all, uh, when did you decide to migrate to the new Acelion uh, uh, platform? You can, mm, you I don't know. have a date on that. I'm sorry to say, Kathleen. Do you know? I I just hap I do happen to know that that decision was undertaken uh, many months earlier. Uh, it was it was in the late summer uh, that, that that decision was undertaken and that process began uh, in in the late summer early fall. I don't have a date, Andrew, but I know it was generally in that time frame. Okay. They say they've been advising their customers uh, for the past three years to migrate to the newer more modern platform? Was there a reason why it took a year and a half before you guys decided to look into it and before it took another six months before you started to implement and migrate to the new platform? Well, I wish I had my IS 
staff that. here to answer that yeah. question because they would be the most accurate in an answer to that question. But I know as the former county executive in Pierce County, you get off legacy systems and you and you you stay with something that you're you feel secure with and that you that works for you. And then at some point in time, you migrate off that. Sometimes that's initiated by for service that you know you may not want that service any longer. And sometimes it's initiated by the fact that your vendor may be going to a new product line. Um, but I think it's important to know that um, we weren't told you're gonna get poor service unless you move immediately to this new system. Um, again, we pay them, they take our money. <laughs> we, we, we believe that we're getting a secure system and, um, and we expect that. And the citizens of Washington state should expect that as well. Right. I have a technical question about where the data was breached. Was it breached on systems from your office or is it breached on systems from Acelion's offices um, and, and where the physical servers are present? Good question. Yeah, would you mind if I, well, I'm going to disappoint you, Andrew, because I, I'm going to share that that is part of the ongoing investigation. We are, we are still in the process of, of determining exactly what happened and when. Uh, and so that sort of information is going to be part of that accounting. Uh, and so we, we won't have that information today. Okay. Uh, sorry, Andrew, I, uh, you, uh, maybe we can come back to you after I did have a follow up. Uh, from a clarification that came in here. Okay. This is, does the 1 million figure include just employment, unemployment claimants or also unemployment fraud victims, state employees, and those connected to DCYF? So a clarification on what is included in that figure. Okay. Uh, so, so that figure is related, one, the 1. 1.6 million is related only to unemployment claims that were filed during the period of January 1, 2020 to December 12. I'm checking that again. <laughs> uh, I think it's December 12, 2020. Through the, through the year. Through the yes, year. I mean, through most of the year. Uh, and so and though, so, so that number is not related to the, the DCYF number or anything like that. Uh, and I'm not, I'm sorry, Adam, could you repeat the rest of it? There was a question about what the number included and then there was another question. That was just a clarification on the one million figure. Is it just unemployment claimants or also including fraud victims, state employees, and those okay. to, to DCYF? Uh, that's, that's right. Um, so um, I, I don't know the answer to anything but, but one of those categories. I do know that, that, yes, I think many state employees were affected uh, by, by this, uh, this particular set of data as well. So, um, so yes, the answer to that is yes. If they filed unemployment claims. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a, a follow-up from Jim Bruner. Okay. Auditor McCarthy, uh, I'm, I want to follow up on the question I asked before, and you said several times here that the auditor, you know, does audits and transfers a lot of information back and forth. But I, I specifically want to hear more about: Did you really need people's full secure social security numbers and very very personal information? Um, and banking information and things like that in order to get to the bottom of what happened, you know, which was a failure at ESD to, to, you know, to flag the right type of activity or something. Was there any thought given to, or did ESD at any point say, hey, uh, maybe you don't need all of this personal identifying information? Well, our auditors who were doing the performance audit um, and the systems audit needed this information in order to accurately determine what transpired and, and could not do it without having the full information provided to SAO to do the comparison because of things that have happened in other states where it, they needed that information to verify that is the best I can tell you. They couldn't do it with just a sampling is the point. Adam, did you, 
Was there any other follow-ups? I thought I. Yes, I've got uh, Jerry Cord oh. with a question. Here we go. Oh. I just wanted to see if I get some specificity uh, again, um, which law enforcement agencies are involved, which local governments, given you do everything from sewer districts to big cities, um, you know, which, how many and which, and finally, where all this information is now, is it in the new third party server in KiteWorks? Is it on a CD-ROM in your office? Where is all this information now? Well, we can't give you the specificity on the law enforcement, but let me just say that we have um, federal law enforcement and state law enforcement investigating. Um, but short of that, we've been advised that we give you that general, that we do have law enforcement um, investigating, doing the investigative work. Um, at this moment, uh, we believe there's about 100 local governments and it's the range as you said jerry um it's a range of could be a fire district it could be a city uh, a town um uh we're not disclosing who they are because they are trying to protect their systems as well um there may be a point in time where we can but at this age we we're, we're our interest is to protect um our governments and then protect the citizens who they represent. Um, we know that there's, uh, I believe, about 25 state agencies um, that were impacted. Um, and remember, as I told you, our universe is about 2,300 um, local governments and state agencies in the state of Washington that we audit, uh, doing a wide range of audits for. Um, and so, um, that gives you at least a, a little bit more information, um, maybe not drill down to who. Um, uh, we have contacted everyone that we know at this moment um, that we have received information and doing our due diligence to look at the scrub through this voluminous amount of files to determine who, who were the receivers and who were the senders um, so that we could let people in those governmental entities know and then I now I'm blanking on your third part of your question. <laughs> he, he, wanted part. To, he wanted to know where the data was now and if it was on a CD-ROM. <laughs> of course, of course, he was joking. And and uh, and and but but in all seriousness, Jerry, um, the the data part of the nature of that system is that the the data um, ages off of it. So it. it it, it does not exist anymore except in its original forms with its original owners, I, I think is probably the, the highest level explanation I could give at this stage. So it's, I guess to answer your question, it's not st still in the place where it was compromised. All right, uh, Andrew indicated he had one follow-up and then we are done with time. So yes, thank you. Andrew. You're muted. Sorry. There we go. Madam Auditor, I'm curious as to why uh, Washington State taxpayers had to learn of this data breach from you when in fact Excelion seems to be responsible according to your version of events uh, for it. Uh, they have not reported a data breach to the state of California where they are headquartered. Um, and so I'm just wondering why we had to hear about it from you and not them? I think that's a really good question to a Cillian or for a Cillian. Um, I do know that two of the other um, large entities, um, and Kathleen, get the, let me get the names right. It's Sure. Well, I'm not going to get the names right, but yes, there, there were other governmental uh, entities that uh, ha have reported an incident with Acelion. Now, it's, I want to be very clear. It, it is, we cannot tie, tie all of us together, um, you know, but, but there's been other reporting on this as well. And so, uh, but I think the answer is, is also that we have a duty uh, as, as the uh, responsible party for this data, even though you know we were we were using a service to help us manage that securely, there are there are duties under the law 
for us uh, to fulfill as well. And so that is why Auditor McCarthy directed us to get this information to the people who needed it. All right, I think that's all the time we have for questions. If you wanna wrap up, Kathleen, we are good. Yes, I think we do. So again, I just wanted to thank all of you very much for your time. Um, you. I believe all of you, <laughs> I believe all of you have my, uh, my email address and uh, cell phone number and for follow-up questions, uh, my colleague and I, Adam, uh, we will do our very best to get back to you as quickly as, can, as we can uh, so you can make your deadlines. Uh, and, and thank you again for your time today. Thank you.